This morning we are continuing to preach a series of lessons that we preach from time to time entitled The Church. This is the second version of these lessons that we've preached under this particular title. And today is the third lesson that we will look at, part one of two, the nature of a local church. And as we do at the beginning of these lessons, if you, we look at the next slide, this is the third lesson in the first three lessons that focus on the definition and the characteristics of the church. The first lesson was, what is the church? Then the nature of the universal church. Then the nature of a local church, which we will begin today and next Sunday, the Lord willing. Then we will have five lessons, the Lord willing, on, on divine authority, which are, is extremely important. How do we know what the Word of God teaches and how to apply it? It will be un, unreliable sources of religious authority. Then the only source of divine authority today. Then how to establish divine authority. Things that are expedient uh, will follow that. And then in that part, respecting the silence of the scripture, very important lesson. And then we will focus on exactly how the church is, the local church is to be organized and is to work. The organization of a local church followed by the work of a local church and then how churches cooperate, the work, uh, independence, autonomy, and cooperation of local churches. And then in lessons 12 and 13, the Lord willing, two errors that people follow even among churches of Christ that pervert the uh, organization and work of local churches. Lesson 12, institutionalism, and lesson 13, the social gospel. And then concluding it all, the Lord willing, lesson 14, the unity of the church, a lesson that we might have alluded to in different ways in other lessons, but we have not devoted in this series a lesson on unity. But we have added that lesson uh, in this series and think it's a fitting lesson that we should end on. So that is our goal. That is our desire that the Lord give us opportunity and health and ability to bring forth these lessons that we all may be edified. And those who have heard these things before might be reminded those who have never heard them among us and wherever you may listen to these online or whatever, that you may be uh, enlightened by these things and begin to be grounded in the fundamentals as it relates to the church. Last two Sundays, we looked at the nature of the universal church. It is composed of all individuals in the world that Jesus saves. That is the universal church, the total of Christian, the total of saved people, uh, the assembly of saved people that Jesus saves. Uh, there is only one universal church. It began on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. We enter it when Jesus adds us to his church. We do not uh, voluntarily join, but he adds us when we become Christians, obey the gospel to his saved body. The Lord keeps track of members, and he accurately does so without any mistakes. It consists of all those who are saved, and so when people say, I want to follow Jesus, but I don't care a thing about his church, then what they're actually saying is, I don't care a thing about people who are saved, so it doesn't make any sense. We cannot be saved without being in his church, has no earthly organization, and that would put a lie to the Roman Catholic Church and any other church that tries to have a uh, universal headquarters and organization over 
local churches throughout the world, has no treasury, uh, has no collective work, that is, a combining of local churches, making them do the same work together and overseen, again, by universal oversight, doesn't have any of that, cannot be divided, membership is not affected by death because we continue in Christ. If we depart this world in Christ, we continue into eternity in Christ, and that is the the whole thing in this life that we obey the gospel, that we seek to be faithful to Christ by his grace through obedient faith, and that we depart this life in Christ. In this last lesson again, we learned that Jesus universal church refers to the assembly of people in the world that he saves both living and dead so actually it includes all the people from Abel the the righteous son of Adam and Eve on down to the present time all those that are saved uh, through the blood of Christ including all those in the gospel age today throughout the world who become Christians and are faithful to Christ. When we think of his church, we must think uh, of people instead of anything else, like an institution or a building. The church is the assembly of Jesus' saved people. The New Testament refers to both the universal church and a local church. And so this is what we want to focus on Today, the nature of a local church. A local church is an assembly of Christians who agree to worship and work together in a specific location. So it's a segment of the universal church confined to a specific region, a specific location where they work and worship together. Local churches are not working units of the universal church, a mistake that has been made both by denominations and even among those in churches of Christ. Individual Christians are the working units of the universal church. That's what we read many times so far and even again from time to time in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. 12 and verse 13. Failing to understand the nature of a local church, that will lead us to pervert its organization and work, as so many do even among churches of Christ. And that is the whole problem. Even among churches of Christ, they have followed the ways of denominationalism many and have uh, perverted the church, uh, local church, and how it works and is organized. And so that's why we are studying these lessons, that we stay with the scriptural teaching, the apostles' teaching, and we do not stray from it and do not get entangled with those things that pervert it. And so we began the characteristics, the nature of a local church. It is composed of Christians assembling in a specific location. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 1, Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes our brother to the church of God which is at Corinth to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus saints by calling with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So he wrote to the local congregation, the local church meeting in Corinth in southern Greece. In 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you, and peace. And so here he is writing to the local church in Thessalonica, in uh, Macedonia, what we would call northern Greece today. And so Paul d is demonstrating to us that a local church, again, 
is a is a assembly of saints that are meeting in a given place to work and worship together. There are many local churches, one universal church, but many local churches across the globe, wherever they may be. Romans 16 and verse 16, greet one another, Paul says, with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Then in Galatians 1 and verse 2, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, a province in the Roman Empire, Galatia, I think we might call that Turkey today, not quite sure, nor, but anyway, uh, that was Paul writing, saying those churches in that area, those local congregations. So there are many local churches. They began at different times and in different places. While the universal church began on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, that is, ten days after Jesus' ascension into heaven. Many other local churches have begun at different times, in different places. Whenever the gospel is preached, whenever people obey it, whenever then Jesus adds them to his universal church, his saved body of people in the world. Then those who are saved in a particular location submit to the apostles' teaching by joining themselves together in a local congregation and worship and work as one congregation in a given area. The gospel, that's God's only power to save us and his only power to direct us as a local church, to direct us as individual Christians that work with local churches. And so we don't go to a universal headquarters, earthly headquarters, to get permission to establish a local church. But when the word of God is preached and people obey, then they have the authority by the word of God as Christians to form a local congregation based on the apostles' teaching wherever they may be in this world. Luke 8 and verse 15. But the seed is the good soil. These are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. And those good and honest hearers who obey that gospel, the seed of the kingdom, that is God's power to save all humanity, whoever you may be. Romans 1 and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And when they preach the gospel in, for the first time in this world, in the city of Jerusalem, ten days after Jesus ascended into heaven, they declared Jesus as the Messiah, as the King of kings and Lord of lords, sitting at the right hand of God, ruling in heaven over earth and heaven and earth where he is, ruling even this day. Acts 2 and verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, that they had been rebellious toward God and had even agreed to and urged the crucifixion of the Messiah, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter did not answer the sinner's prayer or infant baptism or wait for the Holy Spirit to fall on you. But Peter said, Acts 2 and verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, change your minds about your sins, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. 
not being immersed in water in the name of Jesus because you believe you're already saved, but in order for you to be saved by the grace of God, the power of the blood of Jesus. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the blessings of salvation, promise of eternal life, heirs of all that God would have you blessed with in Jesus. Acts 2.41, So then those who had received his word prayed that prayer. Is that what he said? No. Those who had received his word were baptized, immersed in water in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls, added to Jesus' universal church. But there were also those in Jerusalem there they, on that day Jesus' universal church began, but also the first local congregation began as the saints in Jerusalem, newly added to Jesus' universal church, uh, formed by the apostles' teaching, the church in Jerusalem. Acts 2.42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Anybody who asks us to follow something more than the apostles' teaching is, follow, is asking us to follow uh, too much that is not authorized. And anybody that asks us to follow less than the apostles' teaching is not asking enough. We are to abide in the apostles' teaching and not take away or add to it. Verse 47 of Acts 2 praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So the universal church and the first local church all began in Jerusalem the first day of Pentecost after Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended back into heaven. But then there became other local churches Samaria, uh, wherever they were planted, where the gospel was preached, Caesarea. There became other local churches. The Apostle Paul, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and also Corinth. As the gospel was preached and people obeyed the gospel through faith, repentance, confessing Jesus as the Son of God, and baptism for the forgiveness of their sins. Then they joined together to form other local churches devoted to the apostle teaching, to the apostles' teaching. We look at the beginning of the church of Corinth as an example. Acts 18 and verse 1. Acts 18 and verse 1, after these things he left Athens, that is Paul. And they, no evidence that they started a local congregation in Athens. The gospel was roundly rejected. But he left Athens and went to Corinth, south of Athens. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them. Now that was a persecution of Jews, and so they left Rome. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers, that is, Paul and this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks, that is, about the Lord Jesus. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the work, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook off his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own head. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, 
a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized, that is, for the forgiveness of their sins. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you. For I have many people in this city, that is, many who would potentially obey the gospel in that place. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And so we find the beginnings of the church at Corinth. And we can find many others mentioned in the book of Acts. And we know that even about uh, 12 years ago, 12 and a half years ago, we began the church here in central Brooklyn, the central Brooklyn Church of Christ. So we know that wherever saints are willing to worship and work together by the apostles' teaching, that local churches can be begun by the authority of the Lord Jesus, by the authority of his word in the apostles' teaching. We enter when we voluntarily join and are accepted by a local church. When we're baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, the Lord adds us to his universal church, his one saved body of people in the world. But in order to be an accepted member of a local church, we must voluntarily join ourselves to that congregation. And they, in turn, must agree to accept us as a member to worship and work with them. And so there is the difference. In Acts 2 and verse 38, Peter said to them again, Repent and be, each of you be baptized. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will, be, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So when we obey the gospel, repent, and are baptized, and like in verse 47 of Acts 2, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. When we become saved in Christ by becoming a Christian through faith in Jesus, repentance of our sins, confessing him as the Son of God like the eunuch did in Acts chapter 8, and being baptized, immersed in water in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, when we do that, by the power of the gospel, through the blood of Jesus, by his grace, we are saved. And Jesus adds us to his one saved body. We don't have to say, I want to be a member of his universal church. He adds us to that saved body. But in order to work and worship uh, as the Lord commands, we must voluntarily join together with others in any given place. And we must be accepted by them that we may be able to work with them in unity and love. Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, 26. This is the Apostle Paul who had ferociously, ferociously persecuted the saints, not only in Jerusalem, but he would dare even try to do so in foreign cities. But he came to the Lord Jesus and became a Christian in Damascus. And now he is coming back to Jerusalem after preaching in Damascus and after his life being threatened, he came back to Jerusalem, but they are afraid and do not want to associate with him. Acts chapter 9 and verse 26, when he came, that is Paul, Acts 9 and verse 26, when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. Did they want him to be in the local congregation in Jerusalem? No. They had good reason because he had done so much damage 
to the lives of Christians there. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how he had and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas vouched for Paul and explained what had happened. Verse 28. And he was with them moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And so I think we can see voluntarily joined the church in Jerusalem working with them, but they had to accept him. And there's no real formal process involved in it, but it's just a matter of course that we must voluntarily join a local church, and in order to do that, they must accept us as a Christian who is faithful to Christ. Now, what have we learned in our lesson as we look at the summary slide? The final slide that we will touch on today. A local church is composed of Christians assembling in a specific location rather than throughout the world. There are many local churches rather than just one, like the Universal Church. They begin at different times and in different places wherever the gospel is preached and obeyed and people agree to meet and worship together and work together as the Lord commands. We enter when we voluntarily join a local church and are accepted and are accepted by that local congregation so that we can meet and worship together. We've got several more things to mention about a local church, but this is enough to instruct us to begin to think differently about a local church as compared to the universal church and not to become confused. If you're here today and you're subject to the gospel invitation, if you are willing to trust and believe in Jesus enough as the Son of God to repent of your sins and to confess him as the Son of God before men, then be baptized, immersed in water, to be washed by the blood of Jesus, by his gracious, powerful blood, Come up out of the water cleansed of your sins by the blood of Jesus. Begin to walk in newness of life according to the apostles' teaching, changed by the word of God, your character, day by day as you apply that word. Join yourselves to a local congregation in the area where you live. Work and worship together according to the apostles' teaching and that only and look forward to having a home that is incorruptible in eternal life. Those who are Christians, after we have become Christians, when we fall short of his will, let us repent and pray as fallen Christians, and let us turn back to the Lord and acknowledge our sins, pray that we may be forgiven, and have others pray with us if that sin be known beyond ourselves and God. Have others pray with us that we may be forgiven again to grow in his grace and his knowledge. If anyone is here today and subject to that grand, glorious, gracious gospel invitation, we would encourage all to respond at the hour that the Lord has given while we have time no matter what other circumstances there may be, respond to God's glory that we may be saved. Won't you come now and respond as we draw the lesson to a close for today?